Tēnā koutou e tiwi. Nau mai ki tēnei wāhanga o kōrero toi. Uh, kei a tātou ngā mātanga i roti te ao toi i tēnei rangi. Ara ko Ron Te Kaua Rāua ko Maureen Landa. Um, Sino hi hiko te ngā kou, ko whakapiri mai kōrua uh, ki tēnei o ngā rangi e whakātua nei ngā toi Māori uh, ki te ao. Ano e nei rātou mihi. A tēnā kōrua Maureen, kōrua ko Ron. Ron's just popped off a bit. Oh, there he is in his glamorous coat. <laughs> uh, we've been really looking forward to this session this week because you're both renowned artists and we know that you're prolific in your own right. So uh, we'll just get started and get straight into um, the kōrero because I'm sure everyone wants to listen to you and not listen to me go on and on. Um, but anyway, uh, tēnā koe Maureen, I'll just give a brief in- introduction um, to Maureen and then we'll um, uh, hear from Ron afterwards. Ka pai. Uh, so Maureen Robin Lander uh, is a New Zealand weaver, a multimedia installation artist and academic. She's of Ngāpuhi te hikatū, te rorua, Irish, Scottish and English descent. And she's and Maureen is a well-respected and significant Māori artist who since 1986 has exhibited, photographed, written and taught Māori art. Uh, so not only is she prolific in her artwork, she's also nurturing the new generation of artists. Um, continues to produce and exhibit work as well as attend residencies and symposia both nationally and internationally. Now, Maureen, when I had a look at your profile online, um, there's a really long list of mahi that you've been involved in. So I just will touch on some of those uh, aspects. So Maureen went to Wellington Teachers College, uh, has a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Photography from Elam School of Fine Arts, a Bachelor of Arts in Māori Studies, University of Auckland, Masters of Fine Arts in Sculpture, and a Doctor of Fine Arts from Elam of School of Fine Arts at the University of Auckland. Um, she has exhibited extensively and there's a really long list of wonderful shows she's been in, including Hariata's War Garb in 2018 as part of the Napu Festival, um, Flag It uh, from the Depot in Devonport in 2014, the Eternal Thread, which ran from 2004 to 2007, Te Aho Mutila Kore e Museum and Art in Porirua, and then also toured throughout New Zealand and the United States. Ngā Uri O Rahiri from the Gavit Brewster Art Gallery in New Plymouth in 1997. So um, also selected publications, um, te ao tawhito, te ao hau, and to find threads of tradition and innovation in Fatu Kaku Māori Pokes. Uh, Honours and awards, Maureen, appointed the member of the New Zealand Order of Merit for Services to Māori and Art in 2020, and a well deserved honour that is. Uh, your mahi is extensive, and it's a true honour to have you here today, Maureen. So I'd just like to pass the corridor over to you. Um, and welcome, and love to hear uh, a bit of kōrero about your mahi. Tēnā koe, te rangi te rā. Kia ora, Regan. Thank you. Makes me feel tired listening to all of that. But um, <laughs> sort of, I've been exhibiting for nearly 40 years, so I suppose it just adds up over time. I... Um, One of the things that I've done right from the very beginning, which is something I'd like to talk about today, is that I work collaboratively quite a lot. And um, I just wanted to talk about how COVID has impacted on that. I've read 
an article that Ro Hoskins had put up on the Toying Apuhi site just a, two or three weeks ago. And I could really relate to what he was saying. He was talking about working with community, especially iwi, um, with the restrictions of COVID and how difficult that is when you have to rely on doing online meetings, just as we are now, and that you can't do it um, uh, tinana, he says, where you, where you don't meet face to face and you don't get to know the other people before you engage with them. And that is something uh, that over the last two years has really impacted on the way I work. So I'm sure that other people will be able to relate to that as well. I thought it might be quite a good topic to look at. So since 2020, I've done five collaborations and I'll just briefly outline what they were and then I'm going to look at a couple of them in a little bit more depth. So the first one was with um, a friend, Denise Batchelor from Umapere, and we managed to get the work opened before it got impacted. So the show got closed almost as soon as it got open. So I'm sure other people would have had that experience. Uh, it was a very easy work to make because I know Denise very well and it was fun making it. The second one was a work I um, was just beginning with a group of weavers down in Patoni and it was for um, a new building, uh, a big library in Johnsonville and we had only met once. I'm going to talk about that one in a bit more depth. The third one was with Mata'aho. We got impacted in a different way from others. Most of my shows got put back because of COVID, but Toy 2, Toy Order got pulled forward. It got pulled forward because other shows were cancelled at the art gallery. So we had pressure on us to get the work made in a short, shortened time. We also had the pressure of uh, not being able to start exactly when we thought we would because of lockdowns. The fourth one was with a friend who lives down in Whangamata, Kaitaita Watson, who I met in Guam. She's from Kiribati. And um, she and I shared a room when we were in Kiribati, so I knew her well. And I found that really easy to do as well. We just gathered materials that we got on our books and we each made like pare and she made what she calls pao, which are very, they're, they're like the um, Cook Island headdresses in a way, but they have their own particular way of making them. The fifth one was the one I had the most difficulty with. And that was because I never got to meet the people I was working with face to face until we were near the end of the project. And that was really difficult. So if we can go to the images, I'm just going to talk about two of them and sort of outline how, how they went. So you can see the word Manaya there. It's the name of the building and it, it's part of the Tenths Trust in Wellington. Uh, this was the first day where I went to meet this group and I had already teed them up to start looking for Harakeke in their vicinity because uh, we were going to be, everything was just going to be Harakeke. So this was about less than half of the group I worked with. The two people sitting next to me are not part of the group. They're part of the uh, Wellington City Council, the woman with the baby, Eve Armstrong. And the others who are working, who have flax in their hands, are part of the group that I worked with. So this is the Ropu Daranga o Manaya. I've got to know them really well. And uh, it's an ongoing relationship. Just, next one, please. I was uh, working with them to make uh, another version of my flat pack whakapapa. 
um, which had also kutset uh, for Nangatanga. So it was the the way you start a kete with the whakapapa down the middle and then taking the strands and not weaving it up into a kete, but weaving them out to the sides to make those sort of flower or star shapes. And we hadn't decided on a title for this. We knew that it had to go up high and I wanted the title to come out of the process. So as we went on, um, this was the first session, I think, where we got started and I showed a few of them how to make these and then we got shut down. So if we go to the next picture. So I had to develop a way of trying to get them to make them all the same size. So with these little tables from Bunnings became what um, one of them called our table of control. So the um, it sort of it, it, the four quarters and the lines sort of helped to guide us so that all of our points, our arms, would meet at the same place when we put it into a grid. And one of the things that we were doing was just using, we were going to use named varieties of harakeke, but we all got locked down. So it was just whatever we could find in our walking vicinity. And we weren't using much color, just the green, the two, uh, two shades of green, and the rest was just natural. So the only way they could get um, a pattern happening was to use the blacks, backs of the leaf against the fronts of the leaf, or use leaves that had would dry to different colors. So that was quite a challenge, but it was quite lovely in the, the way that it um, showed up all the different varieties of harakiki. So these were 1.2 by 1.2 meters and uh, to cover a, a big wall, three stories high, quite high. Uh, we, we didn't have them down where you could touch them. They were up above that. And we'll just go to the next one. I had to start trying to teach them online and um, I was locked down. I didn't have a anybody to hold the camera for me. And I didn't have the tripod. So it was just a matter of setting something up using the pegs and using words to explain, you know, like what I'm trying to explain is how you set the strips up, one facing up, one facing down, so that when you flip them over, they're both facing upwards, if that's what you want. So, um, I had to do that all, all along the way for those who hadn't, I think I'd only managed to teach about five of them before we got locked down, but they were also able to help each other if they were able to make contact with each other. I'm gonna go to the next one. These were the kinds of patterns that came out. And you can see that one with the yellow and that person was able to find a harakeke that dried to that beautiful gold color and uh, exploit that in the pattern. By this time, we had decided it was, we were already running late to, for, to meet our deadline and we had got up to uh, Matariki period and we decided that seeing the whole kaupapa of the building was based on the forest that used to be in Johnson's clearing. That's why it was called Johnsonville. They cleared the forest, that we would do the stars above the forest. And um, so we called it Fiturangi and these became stars. And when we decided that, they started weaving star patterns and attaching star patterns. I haven't put photos up of that, but um, we'll go to the next one. This is the building and this is how I had different configurations. But this is what we ended up with, two rows above the windows and up to the third floor and uh, one row below the windows. So there were 38, there were 48 altogether, which we had to stack in a little back room. Uh, they had to stack and I had to bring mine down with me when I, when I went, I had to drive down with a car full of the ones I'd managed to make. 
And the day I drove down was the day those two women drove down with COVID, if you can remember that. I thought, oh no, I bet I went to the same petrol station and the same cafe, although they said they never stopped. I'm sure they did. So it was a bit fraught. Next one. This is it being installed, so you can see the kind of, you can see up close from where I'm standing to take the photo, you can get quite close and you can get quite close going up the stairwell as well. Um, I think that's the last one. For, no, there's one more. So that's just some of the group standing there looking up at them and they continue right along past where that barrier is and uh, you can get quite close. That row right down the bottom has, if you could see it close, it has references to stars and children are making them now. Uh, little ones just made from squares with the, uh, I've seen quite a few, I've been tagged into quite a few that school kids are making and they look amazing, I love them. So, that was the difficulties that we had with that one. But the fact that they were a group before I started with them was really helpful. I'll go to the next group. This is a group of students from Auckland University. And this uh, project was to put some artwork into the new atrium for the engineering school. And I I sort of proposed an idea and said that I would like to work with the students because I had been a lecturer at Māori Studies and I always enjoyed working with students. When you work with students, um, they stretch you, you know. And this one, I started with a very basic idea and wanted them to develop, develop the kaupapa and develop the designs rather than with the other one where I already had the design. So the other one was more like, um, if you like to think of a meeting house, tukutuku, where the designs are more or less in place or divai. And this one is more of we as a group generate the whole thing. And I just act as a kind of facilitator and someone who's kind of mentoring them at the same time. So these students didn't necessarily know each other. One came from, from uh, engineering, three came from Elam, and four came from architecture, and they were at different levels from stage two through to postgrad. And we had to start working as a group online. And Lara, who's standing next to me, is the person who coordinated it all. She put up a site and we just had to we had uh, Zoom sessions. She would post anything that I wanted to post because I didn't actually have access. I wasn't uh, enrolled at university or a staff member, but she would put my stuff on and they would post on their ideas and their drawings. We had digipoles to decide what colors we liked, what materials we liked. Um, we had to find it down to, if we go to the next one, Oh, sorry, this is just uh, an overall look at the, this is the materials that we ended up thinking we would use. The reason was that we wanted to use what was available to us in engineering, which was, uh, we could have done 3D printing, which was very expensive. We decided on laser cutting and laser etching using acrylics. And I always wanted to have the harakeke in there as well. So it was a mix of those materials and what, what could we do with them? And so I, I really desperately wanted to have some time for play. And so we spent about four months Zooming during the Auckland lockdown. And it wasn't until right at the end of the year, just before Christmas, we got to have a little bit of a play and uh, um, with just stitching on acrylic and seeing you know what kind of effects we could get and then we had the Christmas holidays then we came back and the next one please we had about a week together to play and decide 
what exactly we were going to do. And then we had about three weeks to do it and get it up before the university would start. So it was very really full on and they were amazing. Um, these two that you can see sitting here, they, we, during that first week, we decided on the kind of patterns based on the tukutuku that was already in the university. Some by Mary Toka that had been there since the 50s, and of course, Tane Nui Arangi. We had all our story, our narrative story about Tane and the bringing back of knowledge. And it was also based on the haka, the new haka for the engineering school, which was um, to negate the old haka that they used to do, which was very politically incorrect. So we had a, a really aspirational haka about um, it was about knowledge and the search for knowledge. And uh, Parani, who you can see sitting there on the left, he's the engineering student. It was his idea that we went with in the end. And he was one of the main ones for coding it. So those two are just coding and working the patterns out. And, and that's how the laser cutter will cut. So just keep going. And we had to work out ways to put layers on. Glue didn't work because you could see it through the transparency. So it ended up with the etching and the stitching. Um, we could create quite a lot of variation on our patterns. We used a little bit of paint work at the end just on the lines. So I'll keep going. And you can see in the background there, that's the Potama pattern, the one that um, Brianna and Bri are stitching on is the Carl Carl pattern. And we also had, if we go to the next one, we had the Niho Niho pattern, and these were the rungs for the ladder structure, which went up the Po. It was called Po Iho, which was about bringing knowledge back down. So like Taungatuku Iho. So we had the these big circles where we did the, um, the narrative, where things built up from darkness through to more light and more pattern as you got more knowledge. It's not perfect, there's mistakes, there were so many challenges, but that's the way that you acquire knowledge, make mistakes. So this is the day that they shut us down, just before we were finished. Well, uh, that's when Omicron hit Auckland in February. And I'm just left there, ready to pack everything up into storage until we can get together again, which is not until the semester break in April. And we just keep going. And that's when we finally get to install. And uh, we weren't sure how far up the scissor lift would go. So that sort of, there were some things that constrained us. Uh, we couldn't go as high up the third pole as we wanted to. And uh, the scissor lift had to come from below and come up through two levels. So that even when we got to uh, install into the circles, the circles um, were not, uh, they had bits and pieces that made it difficult. We were problem solving right up to the last day of installing. <laughs> So um, this was, yeah, towards the end of the semester break, we had to get it up. We didn't quite get it up on the day of the opening, but we just kept going. The next, we had the blessing. We got them to bless. We, we'd done one lot of rungs and, and all of the circles. We got them to bless the rungs that hadn't been put up yet and then kept going because it's... Uh, there were so many holdups along the way with COVID. I think there might be a couple more that just show them once they're up. Oh, yes, that's the process. They're, they're stuck in with magnets. That was a big process, working out how long the mag magnets would last and making sure they would last 20 years. Next one. So that's just a view of, from below of one of the ladder. Uh, structures based on a Maori rope ladder. Another one. 
and that's the one nearest the window, which is the Potama one, which is where, where you get to when you get to postgrad level, which is more of a, a, a time of enlightenment. So we were really working with the architecture of the building, as well as the idea which they had come up with, and which was very strongly, I think um, Parani could have probably performed this whole work through doing the haka. And he did when he um, he did a little bit of it when he at the at the blessing he told the story of it and performed some of the haka on his way through. <laughs> so I just wanted to talk about that and say uh, Ro talked about that we are going to probably be working with both for a while and it's. There's advantages to Zooms and advantages to working remotely, um, but there's also some big disadvantages and the difficulty of working with people that you haven't met and haven't got to know and haven't met face to face. I was just lucky that the students were good at doing that. I didn't even know in our first sessions that I should mute my button <laughs> and if I just nodded I, I thought I was just sort of nodding but I might have been saying yes and suddenly it flicks to me and what, what am I doing up there on the screen I'm not the one who's talking you know and, and I didn't even realize that things like that so in some ways it was the perfect group to work with in that situation because they could handle it even though I found it really difficult so I think we just help each other along the way. And um, I'll just stop there and hand over to Ron. And if anybody's got any questions, we'll deal with it later. It's wonderful. Thank you, Maureen. It's so, um, it, it's, it is the hot topic uh, at the moment is COVID and these new ways that we are um, communicating that actually Kōrero Toy has come from that um, digital space and, and reconnecting and being able to connect uh, over the internet, uh, which we may, and of us may never have come, come about if um, we hadn't been forced into this lockdown space. But it's so wonderful to see that you can still initiate a whakaro, an idea, and come together and, and work through a process and uh, seeing your process, Maureen, you know, from the uh, customary, traditional um, depth of knowledge and utilising natural materials and then how you seamlessly transition into being able to utilise modern materials and technology and bringing in the knowledge, you know, of, of our rangatahi and of all those other aspects but still have such a strong Kaupapa Māori aesthetic and philosophy and background. Truly a, a beautiful example uh, for, for our rangatahi and our, um, our artists to, to see and understand, and even our whānau, you know, that uh, our knowledge systems can exist and be so strong and profound in, in all those different spaces. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, so anybody, if you have any questions, please post them up. And uh, we can come back to those at the end of the session. Uh, but for now, we're just going to um, move over to Ron, to our other special guest. Kia ora, Ron. <laughs> Kia ora. Hey, thanks for that, Maury. Um, that was beautiful. That was stunning. I feel so lucky to have seen, to have seen and heard you talk about your mahi today. It's such a privilege. So I'll just yeah, introduce you, level. Ron. I'll just introduce you Go a bit. Um so Maunga Rongo, Ron Tikawa of Ngāti Parau, uh, has been working prolifically in fashion, art, community and education across Aotearoa, New Zealand for decades. And when uh, you hear the word prolific, I think of Ron often uh, because whenever I see him, he has a whole lot of colourful material around him and he's bringing his bright, bubbly, beautiful self uh, in through his work and sharing with the world. And um, I'll just carry on reading. So using sewing as a conduit to connect with people, he expertly guides workshop participants 
to confidently create with fabric and express their whakapapa genealogy through sewing. His unique quilting style continually explores Matauranga Māori and his whakapapa and atua wahine female deities through bold colour and a tactile application of materials. Breaking the rules of traditional quilt construction, all types of fabric are masterfully stitched together to illustrate scenes from his imagination, his history, and the stories of people influential to his life. And when Ron, um, I remember you showing me one time one of your quilts, it was absolutely delightful and surprising. You had a little person that you had sewn. I think it was a tenoranga tiratanga quilt. And they had a little pew pew on there and you go, yeah, but look at this and whew, you could lift it up <laughs> and do a little, eh. I think it was inspired by Tame Itzi actually and the visit uh, from the Queen or something. <laughs> so uh, welcome Ron, so wonderful to have you here today and um, I'll just pass the corner over to you because I just love to hear your bright shining voice <laughs> and all that you bring. Tēnā koe <laughs> Oh, kia ora. Thanks for that. Um, I made another one of those quilts. It's the one that's at Elam, but I had to cut the string where you pull and the skirts would all flip up <laughs> because it was too much fun for the public. They couldn't resist. Um, yeah, greetings. I'm down in Woodville. Hi, Holly. Um, yeah, I'm down in Woodville. This is my hometown. My parents moved here from um, the Waipu River in the early 1970s. And I'm in my dad's old garage where he would sort of fix cars, fix anything. And that's been my attitude since I've been here. I sew like, I sew quilts like my dad fixed cars. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can feel that energy all around me all, all the time. My dad moved down here. Um, to work on the railways and he physically laid the sleepers for the railway tracks and he brought my uncles and my brothers with him and they were in his gang and um, one thing I really remember from my childhood that, that affected me the most was that we were never allowed anything mouldy in the house, no weaving, nothing. Um, we, they were never allowed to speak mouldy. There was this real fear that he, if, if he lost his job through staying Kyoto, then all my uncles and my brothers lost their jobs too. So there was this really big fear around being mouldy. And I've just come back from up north where I've been working with women who embroider and embroider protest um, blankets and that's their voice they don't they also don't have a voice they also are struggling to be seen are too afraid to talk and so just looking back on my career whatever the best part of it, the strongest, what's gotten me the furthest and sustained me was working with people who don't have a voice. And that's been, yeah. When I look back on the whole thing, that's the number one at the top of it. How, being with the outsiders, the naughty ones, it's much more fun to be self-taught and with the naughty ones outside. I you don't know how many universities I've been kicked out of at the door going in. <laughs> The security guards is not letting you pass. That's way more fun to learn that way. And, and, it's, and it gives you a perspective to fight back from. Um, I want to, did you get the pictures that I sent through? Because um, I, I wanted to talk a bit about COVID as well. Did you know, back at, oh, where'd you go? Is it all good? Am I still there? Oh, yeah. Can you still hear me? Yep. All right. Can you see that image, so, Ron? Yeah. Back in the day, if a Māori person that didn't have a family were um, a takatāpui person was murdered or died of HIV, AIDS, and their family didn't want to claim them, the police would bury them in a rubbish bag bury their ashes and their belongings in a rubbish bag and dig, the, dig a hole in the bush and throw them away like rubbish. And I was thinking with all the kōrero around COVID, 
about all those men, all those friends. I've, I've forgotten a lot of the names, but I'll never forget the faces. Um, how would they feel about us rejecting the vaccine? You know, it took 33 years for them to come up with a vaccine for um, AIDS and HIV. There was no political will thanks to, you know, Nancy Reagan and Mother Teresa and Ronald Reagan and their crazy asses. They were like, um, you know, this is a disease for poor people, black people, degenerates, gays. Um, don't worry about it, just let them go. And, I, and to me, they're all the fun people. <laughs> and it just really brought back, it, it stirred up a lot of feeling. You know, how would those men feel now to see us behaving like this? Um, so I decided to build a rainbow peace walker where I could put them back in and push them back out into the night as calmly and as gently and with as much love and integrity as I possibly could. And that shame, might as well throw that in there while I'm at it, because I like to be the shame buster. I don't have any room for shame in my life. We're too poor to be shame, to be ashamed. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I wanted to use it as a sort of a media to smash that, that shame up and say, actually, I hope you had a, a really great time while you were here. Mm -hmm. I hope you danced. I hope you did everything you wanted to do. Um, so the rain, that Rainbow Peace Walker was a meditation because it took six weeks, I think, of just being in that space of connection and love and that, yeah, and that Te Whare Pōra. Um, yeah, it meant, it, it, it meant a lot to me to um, be able to push them back out to sea with some grace and some dignity, yeah. And I, and so when I do the when I do the workshops, we set up our sewing workshops as a te whare pōra, which to me means a space of no judgment. So it's really great when we can sit around with people who have completely different politics, completely different ideas. Let's face it, everyone's on the different page when it comes to COVID, and um, we can talk about it. And I've noticed people forgiving each other. Um, some might be sitting there and like sewing really angrily, but that sewing gives us a space of no judgment, no violence, um, peacefulness. Yeah, and that's why I see the fucker puppet quilts is more of an extension of weaving than I do of traditional quilting. Um, what I've learned to put into the quilts, I've learned from the, the Māori midwives, the weavers, the healers, the dancers, creating those spaces again and holding those spaces for the people that are participating so that they can be furious or sad or vulnerable because that's where the growth is that's where the risk is so yeah i mean that's what that's about ask me a question up <laughs> oh, straight on to the next one well speaking of people that don't have voices um when my mum left Gisborne, she was under 20. She had three different kids to three different men. And I'm not, I don't want to hurt my sisters because they were wanted and loved, you know, and my brother. But we have that thing of kawe mate. And I noticed that there were a lot of people in, in the cities that had left in the urban drift. They'd left their hometowns and not in the best circumstances. And I thought, this is an opportunity to take my mum's kawe mate back in style. This is how she would want to go home. So I did her as a three-story sparkly quilt. And um, I didn't share this with the public. I only shared it with the, the people in the festival that, that knew that were only one degree of separation from the quilt. But I did my mum as um, Hine Takarua, 
because uh, she's with me the most when I'm driving my mum. But I spent a whole winter on the road last year and the moon was like my companion the whole time. And last year, the moon was so special. Um, on the ferry, driving down to Christchurch, everywhere I went. And so, <laughs> Hine Takarua, at the end of winter, she dives over the moon and she becomes the light on the water. So I thought, well, that's what I'm going to do. I'm, did, my mum is Hine Takarua, put her next to the river, lit her up, let her light up the waters of the city. And just between me and you, that's the way I'm bringing you home. I want you to die. rock that city, rock that Matariki. And now she's um she's the Po for Queen Street for, for Matariki. Uh, she could have never mum passed away in 1986. And um yeah, she just I think she just could never imagine being that. But I wanted to give her a voice. And I wanted to send her off into the night in peace as well and with dignity and a standing ovation. I'm sure she'll be very, very happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> All right. So what we were talking about before with spaces, creating, creating spaces, um, what I meant was this quilt is called Hinatori. So for um, seven nights of the year, the Matariki sisters dive under the water and they have a rest. Um, in this world of peace and phosphorescence, can you imagine it? Can you imagine if we got to design that space with an unlimited budget right now, what that space would look like? We've got the imagination to do that within ourselves. You know, we don't have those spaces anymore that we can access or haven't been built yet. So we just have to carry them within ourselves. We have to create them for ourselves and say, this is Hinatori, I'm holding the space for it, describe it and rest. And I felt like that's what we needed during the last two years was just a temple of my own, a garden of Eden with flaming swords all around it where nobody could get in, no window, no one could push up against the window. And um, for me, having six weeks just to sit there in that space and think about it was like a healing meditation. It was totally self-absorbed, but it was also a gift to the world. It's like you create this for yourself, you know, um, it's our right, it's our, it's so natural to carry that Hinatori space within us. Yeah, um, the, the Daos have just bought this one. Yeah, and yeah. I also see them as flying through the universe. Oh, there's an invite to the next opening in two weeks. <laughs> Down at, um, the Mahara Gallery in Waikanae. And that's really cool. I've, I've um, started a new thing. So with the, with the queer that come along and do the workshops, I'm like, um, with the art galleries, can they have a wall? Can they have a wall to hang their stuff? Because um, it's just as important as what I, it's probably more important than what I'm doing. They've got the knowledge, they're the gatekeepers, they've got the, the aroha, the connection to the land. So Gisborne Museum, expressions and um the Mahara ET gallery have all said yeah yeah of course so it's, it's the, the one on the right is um by Hawangi and oh my god she knows so much whakapapa to the area I'm really privileged to, to have them there and it sort of reminds me of how you know we totoko someone with a song after they've spoken I don't know if I'm supporting them or if they're supporting me but um that's just one of the ways that we can subvert galleries to our will, to our culture, to our way of thinking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, there we go, Hinatori again. So yeah, she's down at um, Commercial Bay, um, which is at the bottom of Queen Street lighting up for, for another week if anyone wants to get down and, and see it. I started this on the first day of the last lockdown. 
I had no fabric. I was panicking. I was like having to make a three-story sparkly quilt and I had absolutely no fabric. I was off to Auckland the next day. My bags were packed and I was going to get it all up there. So I put out a panoi on Facebook and everything on that quilt came through the mail pretty much from Invercargill to um, Kaitaia. Mm, it all came through the mail. I started with the nose because that's all I had. I was cutting up lampshades, pencil cases, belts, saris, bedspreads. It was nothing was safe in the house. Yeah. So that's it. That's a collaborative effort. Mm. Oh, yay. I made this one this year. And this is, so our whare, our house here is an old railway house. Me, my dad and my brother bought it for um, $15,000 <laughs> back in the 80s. And this is, um, this piece is called Payday at the railway house. Because payday, <laughs> payday was always a thing. You've got mum with the guitar. Yee-hoo, yee-hoo. There was always that energy around, around payday. It was a break. It was a time when everyone was happy. And so I've got the little whales at the end of the arms on the mahi. We got to just pulling in that abundance, pulling in that music, that um, strength, that resilience. Um, and... While I was making it, I was thinking um, those lovely people at Destiny Church were having another go at Takataupui. And I thought, you know what, we're, we're an important part of the family. We're the ones that buy the school shoes, um, pay for the school trips. Uh, we're the ones that step in and when, when, when things go wrong. We've always, we're, we're the songwriters, we're the, you know, we're an important part of the family, not a risk to the family. Um, yeah, not a threat to traditional family. We are part of a traditional family. So I did um, Uncle Glitterbeard up there in Rainbow above the house. Um, yeah, yeah, just to... Takatapu are, are, are a really important part of every family and just trying to decolonize that whole um, rubbish about us oh thanks for the love heart about us being other because we're not other I'm right in the middle of all my sister's lives and all of their kids lives yeah yeah Got it wrong. and that's you know you, you hit it on the head and what I really appreciate with your work is you talk about uh, some really deep Kaupapa that often isn't exposed, you know, um, like what happened to Taka Tapui, you know, back in the days. And even now as, you know, I understand Taka Tapui as being the specialist, you know, but yeah. they often have these really amazing gifts. So, um, sorry, but uh, just to share a bit about uh, a cousin of my mother's, Graham, uh, when he was alive, you know, they were so close, but he was... He had the whare kai. And whenever you went to the whare kai, it was the most amazing experience, you know, <laughs> because it's about manakitanga. So when people went to the whare kai, there were like three tiers of <laughs> kai and the most beautiful, you know, presentation, flowers. And now that he's gone, you know, that's, that's gone in our whare kai. So definitely, you know, Takatapui, they bring this beautiful aspect that is so important. It's so important in our family, definitely, you know. Um, well, my mum is Takatapui, actually, and, um, uh, you know, she, um, she really has opened my world to, to just so much, you know, um, being able to feel yeah. the world in, in a... You know, I had a really bad reaction to the booster. I've lost vision in my eye, my hearing's gone, my memory's gone, but hey, I don't regret it. I mean, those friends of mine, they'd be, we'd be happy to have those things. We'd be happy to have those things. And I don't have to make any more memorial quilts, you know. All around the world, I, I say to the kids, you know, all around the world, kids your age, 
you know, they're on land that's occupied by armies that are trying to take their resources and wipe them out. And all they've got to fight back with is embroidery, rap music, theatre, dancing. Yeah, use it. Um, and I have no sympathy for the ones that turn up with $2,000 machines and, and, and don't know what to do. You know, <laughs> can you imagine? <laughs> but um, all we had to fight back with in the day was the AIDS quilts. You know, they were, if, the, if the American government was going to ignore the situation, I worked with those mothers of those sons that passed away. And, oh, that was so hard. Cutting up their clothes, that's all they had. That's all they had to fight back with was memories of their kids. Cutting up their clothes, making memorial quilts, sending them to America and just covering the whole lawn at the White House. Like, you can't ignore that. that, that that's the power of art. And that's the power of, you know, that's our weapon, that's our voice. Mm. And that's it, and it's a true testament to, you know, you don't have to have all those flash, expensive things. Even, <laughs> you know, even Maureen in your practice, you know, it's there, it's accessible. Just use what's around us and, and our voice um, speaks so, so true, um, especially when you come from that, you know, that true place of aroha and, and about the people. Thank you, Ron. I just do have um, some questions here that have come through. Um, Maureen, um, so Margie's online. She just wants to know if you remember the very first piece you made and what, what was it? The hens, what you call the very first piece. I remember trying to make karaura when I was a kid. My mum was very good at making a hangi, but she didn't know how to work with flax. I did make one, but I didn't know how to finish it. It wasn't until I joined the Māori Women's Welfare League in Māngari, and we got asked to make 500 for Tapuya. It was a crash course, and I found I was very good at it and loved it, making, working with Harakiki. So, can you call a roro an artwork? I don't see why not. And then when I went to Elam, one of the first installations I did had roro in it with that whakatoke about, you know, you're with yours and with mine, we can make the feast. And I just had it in a very sort of bare kind of environment because it was the focus. So I would say, yes, probably that would be the first artwork that continued to resonate. Well, and that's the best training too. And you, I've seen your practice actually uh, continue that tradition of making 500 <laughs> yeah, um, I think uh, I, lo I love being with weavers and since I've moved down to away from Hokianga and can't go to Margarita's cow shed anymore you know, like we used to go there every second Friday and I used to drive back to a Marquee thinking oh I just had such a lovely day you know it's all about sharing it's all about food <laughs> so um that was the thing I meant to say I missed with the students we couldn't do that it didn't feel like real wānanga at all it was just very different but we we did they did manage to sneak in a few food things but then they all caught COVID and I didn't because I I was trying to protect myself <laughs> Yeah, well, they didn't all, but one or two did, and that's we got shut down. It's a, a, such an important part of the process, isn't it, Maureen? Um, you know, you yeah. have to finish work, but actually it's that process and what happens in those engagements that, that are the real gems. So we did have that down at, um, at um, with the Manaya weavers, very much around sleeping, eating, when we could get together. 
Yeah. I wanted to ask you, Ron, did you go right up to uh, right up to um, Whangaroa? Did you work with Frances Galton? She does blankets with the kids. They they she does protest blankets. Yeah, I was trying not to name names. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but yeah, isn't she incredible? And their work is amazing. It's so it needs to be recognised internationally. I think they're the New Zealand answer to G's Ben. <gasps> Yeah, I love them. Well, we managed to get them into an exhibition in, in the Treaty Grounds um, Gallery. We did one called Cross Cross uh, Cross Marks, and it was about um, exchange between missionary wives and Maori women, and how how those embroidery te- techniques went straight into the cloaks with wool. And um, we, I was always very interested in that. But Francis and the children and the nannies they did the most amazing array of blankets which we put all the way up the stairs and in the area as you went into the gallery there's no way you could not see them and you could see them from down as you went into the museum they kind of pulled you up the stairs they were just amazing aren't they incredible Mm. absolutely incredible I'm seeing Francis tonight over at Timanoa. I say hi yeah. from me. Hi. Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. yeah I saw her at the I uh, first saw her at the Treaty Grounds on Waitangi Day with her blankets hanging on a long line, and uh, was very t- just started talking to her. Then went and visited her. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I think their work's exciting. I think their work's really exciting. Mm. Yeah. Ron, I just have another question for you. Um, Margaret wants to know how do you start make, making work? So, what are some important aspects in your process from conception? Well, there's lots of different there's lots of different starting points. Sometimes it just comes down to what fabric you've got on the day. What's the best thing you can make out of this pile of rubbish to pay the rent that week? Other times it's there's a there's a, a saying from back home that I really love. Um, it wasn't always the prettiest person that won the beauty pageant at the Marae. It was the one that needed to win it the most that won. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you just have to take your pick of what's resonating the most, what's making you feel the most, who deserves it the most, who's been unseen, that needs a voice. Um, yeah, it's a whole lot of things like that. It, there's the practical side and then there's the spiritual side and then again there's trust in your in your um tupuna sometimes i don't know until after it's finished what what, what it was all about <laughs> yeah, yeah but um this is my workshop it's sort of like a library i've got purple i've got all my fabrics sorted into different suitcases so it's like a big coloring in book of life just yeah fun starts with fun and and what resonates what makes you gives you the most feels yeah Mm. i really love that embodiment of your mum and how she's sparklier than sparkles and bigger than big Um, we know that idea of awe, like after we pass away, our spirit gets lighter and lighter and lighter. Well, to me, that just seems like we keep evolving. We keep dealing with the stuff that happened to us here. And I think if we, um, it's like a vision board. I want to see the people that passed away as this, on their best day ever, what they evolved into, not what they were here but what they evolved into on that side. Because if we um, still see them as sick and broken and poor hara and at a deficit, we're trapping them into this vision of what they used to be, but giving them the chance to keep evolving on the other side. Um, so they, they're like, the artwork's all like a vision board for, for what, they, what I see them as now after they've gone on to the other side and kept working on what they needed to keep, kept evolving. Yeah. Yeah, that's so amazing. Thank you, Ron. Uh, Maureen, just a question for you. Uh, your piece in Toy 2, 
Um, could you just elaborate a bit on um, some of the uh, discussions or some of some things that um, in the development of that piece? It was very larger than life and, and so powerful. Oh gosh, that's a whole big other session. And I think you'd need to get Mata on with me yes. to talk about that one. It it's, sounds like a there's, beautiful... There's so many layers to it and so much in it that I can't give you a one sentence kind of answer except that we weren't commissioned to make Hinekitama, but we couldn't see how we could make Hinenuitapu without making Hinekitama. They are both the same person. And it's just like night defines day and day defines night. You can't have, you don't understand darkness unless you understand light. So um, to just be asked to do Darkness is not, it's only half the story. But then Hineti Tama has her own very poignant story, which, and I would really like to have seen some kind of debate around uh, how Maori mythology is not really a good template for young Maori women. And that would have been a discussion that I would like to have seen teased out a bit more from that work. Especially now, because a lot have been developed, you know, from a missionary point of view, yeah. isn't it? Very... We, we just wanted to reinterpret mm. Hineki Tama as someone who had agency. He made her decisions and had good reasons for making the decisions that she made. And... Uh, the word shame that you used, Ron, Fakama, we would rather interpret that as to make light or to be enlightened and make a decision based on that. Mm. Fakama seems to be something imposed on young women by probably missionaries right across the Pacific. So, you know, that would be one thing that um, we'd like to see happen. So powerful, Maureen, and you've hit it right there. Uh, that whakama that um, is imposed upon us as wahine, as takatapui, all those stories, you know, that, that, that we've had to survive under and now it's about unravelling that and bringing in the light and the truth. You know, in our mm. places. And mm. I'd just um, like to wrap up today. We, um, we've come to the end of the session, but I'd just like to say a big thank you to you both for sharing your cordero. And I know this is just a start, um, but uh, such a valuable session. And I'd just like to say thank you. If you'd like to share anything before we leave, then we still do have time. Um, I'll just hand the cordero over to you. I'll just see if there's any questions that come through. Uh, we just have um, people sending big mahi and thank you to you both for today. Um, so, Neira te mahi kia koutou e mātaki mai nei uh, ki e nei uh, kai mahi toi tino matatau uh, e, e whakātu ana e kōrero ana in a quarter of me, me rang on a ETV. A ETL, I know you're made at the Hikia Kura, Maureen, Kura Kuran, a Kokita Kukapu, a Kate Tino Romo Anako, a Kita Kura for the Piri Mai Kata to me, Itina Rangi, where I made at the Hikina Kura, Heiko Neva. Lovely to meet you, Maureen. Uh, I was really Thank pleased you. to meet you. <laughs> Love your work. Love your work. <laughs> yeah. Aren't we great? Yeah. Awesome. You're so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Love you both. <laughs> Thank you. Okay.